what is the natural history of this if untreated? So let's start with what percentage of patients that sustain a concussion, and let's just take all comers, so we're not going to differentiate how they got their concussion, whether it's in a car or on a horse or whatever. Yeah. What percentage will end up like the gentleman you saw today where this thing ain't getting better until he sees a specialist? Is that like 5% of people, 25% of people? I, I wish I knew. I don't, no one's done that kind of work. We don't know the denominator, basically. We, we don't. If you walked a day in my shoes, you'd think it was very common <laughs> because they're coming. Right. You, you have a huge selection bias, obviously, of the huge sickest people. Huge selection bias. So basically, yep. but I, I really do feel like a lot of kids will, will be fine after concussion. Uh, but there's certain meaning that they probably work out of it and they're fine. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had moments in my life where I remember playing sports and getting hit and, and feeling foggy and dizzy, you know, and, and I didn't have any problems from that that I'm aware of. Uh, so this happens, I think fairly commonly and kids are fine, but there's, I think certain, certain risk factors, certain personality types, certain biomechanics. It's a, it's a confluence of factors that end up with these patients ending up down this pathway where they can really get in trouble with it. So and I don't think it's that all that infrequent. I mean, it's it, it does happen. Mickey, do we know anything about the effect of concussion on subsequent risk of brain disease? So one of the things we talk about a lot on this podcast, of course, is dementia, yeah. both Alzheimer's d dementia and, of course, all other types of dementia, everything from Lewy body to, right. you know, small vessel, et cetera. Do we have any insight into a relationship between those does a if two people who are identical in every way in terms of predisposition and whatnot and other factors one person sustains multiple concussions in their life the other does not do we know if that has any bearing on risk there's been some pretty good research done on that um a lot of work done out of uh uh mass general in boston uh, grant iverson's written really well on this topic and the studies that have come out from him and his group, and I respect that group, we, we, we can see some relative increases in anxiety in some of those patients. But overall, the studies have been pretty good about showing this. We don't, we're not seeing any proclivity towards dementia with these mm. patients or proclivity towards Lewy body or proclivity towards other neurodegenerative illnesses now, it depends on what research you're looking at. As you, as you know, the, the, the research world is highly variable. Um, and, you know, you look at other camps that would support that people that have repetitive head injuries will end up with, you know, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And, but those are, you talk about selection bias. I mean, they're studying patients who are donating their brains because they have problems. And so... We have a study going on right now here at UPMC. I think it's one of the best controlled studies done in the area where we have a number of former NFL players, a uh, very large sample size coming to us and we're doing a three-day evaluation. We're doing a full neuropsych battery. We're doing really fancy imaging with them. We're doing uh, lumbar punctures. We're looking at CSF. We're looking at different biomarkers. We're looking at sleep study. We're doing a full deep dive on their neuro neurological health. I mean, like a, the deepest dive you could do. And then importantly, we're matching them to controls that haven't had the exposures. And we're doing a very well-controlled study looking at the prevalence of neurodegenerative issues in patients that have had repetitive head injury versus patients that have not. And we're year two and a half into that study right now. And we're just about to dive into our first statistical analysis, looking at all this information. So this is one of the better controlled studies out there right now. And there are other groups doing similar work. So we're going to have very good scientific answers on this question. And then relatively near future in the next several years, you'll see studies come out from these different groups. And that's why we do research. You don't want to get your research in the New York Times, that's for sure. You want to do well-controlled, 
empirical work, which we're doing. And I think we're going to have a very good understanding of this issue and more clarity to it in the relatively near future. Is it, and I know that CTE is not your area of expertise, but is it your intuition that CTE is the result of untreated concussions that accumulate repeated injuries? Uh, the, the, speaking of the New York Times as my source of information, my, my vague recollection of this was the idea that CTE was not so much the result of major concussions, but basically constant accumulated you know, sub-concussive injuries. Uh, but, but again, I could be totally misremembering that. No, I think you're remembering it right. Now, whether that's scientifically accurate or not is a different story. Mm. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. And that's why we're doing the research. But, but the, the science hasn't evolved to have a definitive statement on these issues, in my opinion. And what I know anecdotally is I see patients who are absolutely convinced they have CTE that get better with our treatments and don't have problems after we treat them. And there's nothing worse than patients that think they have some debilitating, life-threatening disease where there's no possibility for help. It doesn't go well in those patients when in fact, a lot of the problems that we see, there are treatments. And a lot of patients aren't aware of that. And it's very sad to see that happen. And we see that a lot. That's kind of an amazing thought. I never really imagined that, but it's it's certainly possible that there are going to be a lot of people who either played sports professionally or at a very high level who could easily think that they're in the stages of CTE, um, and maybe they're not. Maybe this is a concussion that hasn't been appropriately treated. I'll even and of take, course that a, take that a step further. We see patients that are suicidal from this, and it's very scary where this will take you because remember we're talking about patients that have biologically derived sympathetic nervous system arousal and high anxiety and they feel horrible they're not working they're not exercising they're not regularly with their sleep they're not social they're ruminating all day long i mean the suicide risk in that population is very very high and so you wonder where this leads to and some of the suicidality that we see in patients, like what percentage of those patients didn't have those problems, but they believe they did. And that's a yeah. function of, again, what I talked about earlier about how when you have an increased awareness with no solution, it can really lead to a lot of hysteria. And unfortunately, we can see that. And it's very devastatingly sad to see that in some of our patients. And, um, I think we need responsible science to lead us to better answers to we really understand this. And I understand the need to talk about this stuff in the media. And like you said it earlier, like we see so many patients because of that awareness, right? And that's a good thing. I mean, it's really leading to a lot of people getting help that wouldn't have received help. But on the flip side, it can be very dangerous as well. Mm -hmm.